The Kings playoff party is on hold for now. We'll talk about that and more with LA Kings insider Zach Dooley on this edition of Locked On LA Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, welcome to Locked On LA Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On LA Kings your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love you to leave us a positive comment on Apple Podcasts if you're a fan of the show. And we are on YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. I'm Eddie Garcia, your host of Locked On LA Kings. I've worked in sports media for the past 30 years, 20 plus years at the Fox Sports Radio Network. Also co-host of the Puck Podcast, a weekly NHL review show. That's been putting out content for the last 17 years and, of course, a passionate L.A. Kings fan for over 30 years. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Well, the L.A. Kings are still on the verge of clinching a playoff spot. We're going to talk about that and more with L.A. Kings insider Zach Dooley. You can follow him on X on Twitter. He is at DooleyLAK. And, of course, check out all his good work on LAKingsInsider.com. And he's also in the arena during games doing reports. He's on the radio network as well. He's all over the place. That's why he's the Kings Insider. Hey, Zach, how are you? What's up, Eddie? I'm glad you mentioned all the stuff that I do because your laundry list of jobs uh, was kind of outweighing me a little bit. I felt a little bit inferior. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Uh, well, Zach, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I was anticipating talking to you about the Kings clinching a playoff spot. But that did not end up happening. They lose to the Ducks in Anaheim 3-1. to one. Uh, Considering what was on the line, considering their success against Anaheim with an eight-game winning streak, I was pretty confident they were going to take care of business. They were going to clinch that playoff spot. That didn't happen. I know I'm coming at this from a, pa- a fan perspective, but the result was surprising and, and disappointing uh, that they didn't get it done last night. I mean, I think it's fair, right? You, you go into that game, first chance to clinch when you control it by being able to win to get in. And then the Kings started the game so well. They came out hard. They were playing their game for about 10 minutes. Akil Thomas scored the goal. And then for whatever reason, from that point on, the Kings kind of stopped playing Kings hockey. And in the NHL, the lines are so much finer than I think that we realize between the teams that you might consider to be like good teams or bad teams, because there are no bad teams. And Anaheim, while they're pretty low in the standings, they're not having a great year. If you don't, play that hard style of game you're gonna lose and i think unfortunately for the kings they i think they might have expected things to go i don't know if easy as they were after they went up but something changed and they stopped playing their game and you got to give credit to the ducks they played hard they earned the win that they got and the result was i think a really disappointing night for the kings for sure and a missed opportunity to just kind of get that clinch behind them and enter this final four-game homestand knowing that the playoffs were already a certainty. You don't want to get too high over any win. You don't want to get too low over any loss. You go into the locker room. You talk to the coaches and the players after these games. What was the mood like in the locker room after that missed opportunity? I mean, it certainly wasn't great. Um, but uh, but at the same time, I think that we see the the outside of it, You know, the, the peaks and the valleys. They're so high and they're so low when you're on the outside no matter what happens on the inside, they're much less high and they're much less low. Um, they, they definitely trend more towards that middle. Um, but with that being said, you know, Jim Hill are not happy with the way that his team played in the final 50 minutes. Um, players in the room, not particularly happy with the final 50 minutes. They know that their level is higher than what they gave last night. We've seen how high that level is when the Kings execute that way. Um, but just wasn't a night when they didn't. And I think that led to, you know, a disappointed team, a disappointed coach, a disappointed fan base, um, and certainly some things to correct heading into the Calgary game. Well, the Kings can clinch a playoff spot tonight if the St. Louis Blues lose in regulation to the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, on paper, that seems like maybe a mismatch, but then again, on paper, so was the Kings against the Ducks. So we'll see what happens. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then the Kings, as you mentioned, can clinch with a win at home against Calgary on Thursday. Uh, You mentioned it. We'll stay a a little bit positive as far as last night, but rookie Akil Thomas gets the only goal of the game for the Kings, his second NHL goal in four games since his call-up playing on the fourth line. Uh, That's been a nice late-season story for the Kings, hasn't he? 
honestly, man, it's awesome. Like he's come in and just done the right things. Like I think his debut was really hard. It was at the end of a road trip. Kings were in Winnipeg, two teams that were really fighting for playoff points, playoff positioning. Didn't really settle into that game. It was really high intensity. But then he gets another chance in San Jose. He scores his first goal. He comes home, plays against the Canucks, plays almost 12 minutes, a career high. Goes into Anaheim, scores the go, scores the game opening goal. And when you get guys who come up from the AHL, they're used to playing a certain role, certain minutes. Sometimes they struggle to adapt when they're asked to play like a fourth line role that they're not familiar with. But Akeel Thomas has this sandpaper element to his game that allows him to be successful in a first line role or a fourth line role. And I think that's what's made him kind of special. He's come in, he's brought a lot of energy. He's really embraced that role alongside Blake Lazat and Trevor Lewis. We know how those guys play the game. And I think Akeel has been very capable of playing that kind of game as well. But he's also got some touch to his game. He's got 20 plus goals, 20 plus assists in the AHL. We're seeing a guy who gets his goals by going to the slot, going to the net. Um, really good story too. You know, a really nice guy. Um, really happy to see him get this opportunity because he's had so many injuries to overcome over his first three years. It's been a really well-deserved couple of games for him. And if he keeps playing like this, I mean, probably not going to come out if he if he keeps up this level. So good on him for coming in and, and taking the, taking advantage of the opportunity he got. You mentioned injury. There is some Kings news today. Forward Alex Turcott assigned to Ontario in the AHL on a conditioning loan. Is that related to Carl Grunstrom returning soon? I would say unrelated to Carl Grunstrom. More related just to Turk's situation. Um, he's on LTIR right now. Um, is on that for a mandated couple of more days. Um, so for him, it makes sense to get him down to Ontario to play a couple of games at that level. Uh, the rain play Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, I believe. I'm um, not sure if Turk will play tonight, um, but he'd be eligible to play in all three of those games, plus potentially two more, um, which is what comes when you have a conditioning loan on LTIR. So I think it's more related to Turcotte specifically. Um, he has not played a game since I believe March 19th when the Kings beat Chicago. Um, so that's almost a month. Um, get, getting him back into game action himself, I think, is more um, what this one's about. Carl's timeline's a little bit different. Still not sure exactly where he's at. He's close. He's been in a regular jersey now for a little over a week. Um, but the latest timeline we got was not ready just yet. So I think they're kind of on separate paths, um, but both getting close. Well, this is probably the last time we'll talk to you, certainly uh, until the playoffs get going. Hopefully, the Kings have a run and we can get you back on in the postseason. But I want to get your thoughts on this regular season for the Kings and look ahead to some playoff stuff as well. We'll do that next here on Locked on LA Kings, your team every day. When you're drafting your fantasy team, do you ever wish you could handpick the best stars for your business team? If you're building a talent roster, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find the top level uh, talent fast with Indeed's powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and virtual interviews. Indeed does all the hard work for you. Search for a job. They'll match you with your qualified candidates with resumes that on Indeed fit your job description. Uh, with Indeed, you can start hiring fast. Over 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent. Indeed knows that when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job must have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. We continue with LA Kings insider Zach Dooley. Uh, Zach, barring a, something really unforeseen, the Kings are almost certainly going to make the playoffs. Maybe get the three seed in the Pacific. Uh, maybe get around 100 points. Um, when you look back at this regular season, do you think this is kind of pretty much what you and most people expected out of the Kings? Certainly to be a playoff team finish in the top three in the Pacific and get around 100 points? When you say it like that, yeah. Um, I think the path to get here has been a lot more of a roller coaster than anybody could have projected, right? Like the start of the year, they won 11 straight road games, 16-4-4 four and four out of the gate. I think that was higher than probably anybody could have projected. Uh, the month of January, probably a lot lower than anybody could have projected. I don't think anybody would have had a coaching change in there. I don't think 
anybody would have had Victor Arvidsson missing this amount of time, you know, and, and maybe line combinations not as fluid as you would have liked. So I, I think that at the end of the day, the expectation was a playoff team, right? And it doesn't necessarily matter. We all know that with the Kings, where you are in the playoffs, you have to get in and win your games. Um, so from that perspective, yeah, I mean, I think it's where everybody expected this team to be. I think the path to get here has been a lot windier than expected. Um, but there's still four games left. There's still a chance for this team to be a 100-point team if they close strong. Um, if you set a 100-point season and you're in the 2-3 spot in the Pacific, that's probably exactly where people would have projected this team, even if they could have never predicted the path the Kings actually took to get there. I talked on Tuesday's show about some of the surprises for the Kings as far as players go this season. Um, I won't influence your decisions, but I wanted to ask you, what are some of the surprises for you this regular season as far as a player standpoint? I think number one has to be like Alex LaFerrier. Um, mm -hmm. He wasn't with the team in Australia, which means he wasn't projected to not only make the team, but not even be that first, second, third guy up. Yeah. And from training camp on, this guy's come in, and he's taken advantage of every opportunity that he's gotten. He produced in the preseason, um, produced in the regular season, and he has kind of cemented himself as an everyday player in the NHL as a rookie. Um, he played four AHL games at the end of last year, none this year. Um, so really good on him for coming in and taking advantage of opportunity. You know, there was a suspension in the preseason. There was an injury. And you need guys to step up in those situations. And Laferriere, while I don't think many guys, many people would have had him on the team in September, um, excellent job of him of just kind of seizing his opportunity and making the club and, and never looking back. Uh, I think Trevor Moore, certainly 30 goal scorer. That's been a big surprise. And uh, Quinton Byfield, I think most people felt this was going to come with time. I don't know if we thought it might happen this year or not, but I think those are two, two, two uh, surprises this season for me as well. No, totally agree. Um, I, I think for Q, I, I think this is kind of what I expected from Quinton. Um, everyone looked at his goal total last year, right? And they were like, oh, three goals, three goals. Like his underlying metric showed that it couldn't possibly be that low again. Like the amount of unlucky stats that he had supporting those goals was wild. Um, it was obviously going to go up. Maybe not the level of impact that he's had on his overall game um, from Quinton, but having a really strong year, we all knew that this was in there. Uh, the ceiling for him is so high, but the floor is also pretty high. Like he gives you a pretty honest game each and every night. Hasn't scored in a while. He's been stuck on 19 goals, but you're still noticing him impacting games in a positive way. Um, great story for Trevor Moore, because we know that Trevor Moore always impacts games as well. I don't think anybody would have pegged him at 30 goals. Um, so really good on him for playing the way that he has. He was this team's probably best offensive player in the first half of the year. I think there was all-star talk for Trevor Moore kind of going into that break. Got cold a little bit as the team got cold, um, but he's finishing really strong. So that's a guy who's earned everything. He was undrafted, broke into the league as a worker, as a penalty killer, as a bottom six guy, got his chance in the top six and never gave it back. Um, earned himself a contract extension here. And now he's a 30 goal scorer. So that's a guy who I think deserves everything that he's gotten and great call on both those guys. Um, terrific years. I, I think for both those players. And Adrian Kempe is not a surprise. He's still, you know, one of the marquee players on this team, arguably the best scorer, pure scorer on the team, but he's kind of evolved into a better all around player. I mean, his, his assists and his points are way up. Goal scoring is a little bit down, but it's interesting how he's kind of rounded into maybe a more balanced player. I think that last year, Adrian Kempe established himself as an elite goal scorer. And now I think he's established himself as an elite hockey player. Um, that's kind of an important distinction, right? Like he, he might score 30 goals. He might not. But you're looking at the way that he's playing with more impact on the game. Like he will score probably 10 to, 10 to 14 fewer goals this year. But I think you could argue, and most people would, that he's impacting games greater than he was last year. Um, he's developed into such a good player for this team. Um, he's, in a, he's a bona fide first line winger. He's impactful defensively. He kills penalties. He's a great puck transporter between zones, and he still has those goals in his game. So he might lead the team in scoring for the first time in his career. Um, so re really nice year for Kempe for sure. Maybe for some, Cam Talbot's a bit of a surprise. Um, I, I thought early on, I thought he could be 
this type of goalie for the Kings, uh, certainly with a very strong defensive team in front of him. Um, 36 years old. He's played in 51 games this year. He's kind of been like the team, though, right? A great start. Gets to be an all-star. Then he goes down with the team and then back up again. Um, any thought about his season and and maybe what he might play over these final four games? Are they looking to get him maybe a little bit of rest before the playoffs, or does he want to maybe stay sharp and keep playing what he, you know, kind of the schedule he's been on? I'm sure that we'll see David Riddick at least once or twice. I think the Kings, especially if the Kings are able to clinch, you know, I think they'll certainly want to give Riddick a couple of games to make sure he's sharp too, right? You want both guys ready to go come the playoffs. With Talbot, it's interesting because I think a lot of people looked at his last year in Ottawa and said, this is the goalie that he is, but he had a career track record that suggested that he is a lot more than that goalie, right? Like he's been a guy who's over a nine ten save percentage in his NHL career. He's been that caliber of a goalie for the, for many teams um, throughout his career. So while I don't know if anybody expected this quite level of numbers, because if you remove like a five game sample in the middle, we're probably talking like a Vezina candidate with the year that he's had he had a stretch of, of five games where he was zero and five save percentage was like under eight but if you take those five games out you're talking at one of the best goalies in the league so Talbot's had a really nice year he's been that stabilizing force for the Kings in net um really impressive and I, I think you saw it correctly like it's a guy who this is kind of the, the type of goalie that he's been in his career I think people just weren't looking far enough back to see it yeah, I think I was looking back to when he was in Minnesota and pretty much carried them yeah. to the playoffs. It'll be interesting for him because, you know, when they he kind of carried Minnesota to the playoffs, then they went out and got Marc-Andre Fleury. I guess they didn't believe in Talbot. He doesn't get to show what he could do in the playoffs. So I think he's going to be very hungry to show what he can do in the playoffs, assuming, of course, that the Kings get in there. Um, looking ahead to the playoffs, uh, Jim Hiller has used at times that 11-7 setup with the 11 forwards and 7 D. Last couple of games, he's gone with Philip Deneau returning. He's gone back to that 12-6 setup. Is there any – has he talked at all about a preference as far as that goes for the playoffs, or is he a guy that kind of keeps his options open? So in general, I think that Jim Hiller does like the 11-7, but he didn't like it with three centers. So when Deneau was out, you only had Kopitar, Dubois, Lazat, who were true natural centers. And he didn't like how the 11-7 flowed without Dino in the lineup. Now that he's back, I could see the Kings going back to an 11-7. Jim Hiller, I think, personally kind of prefers it. Likes that flexibility, kind of tinkering with his fourth line. But at the same time, I'm looking at the way that the Thomas, Lazat, Lewis line has played over the last two, saying that's a really impactful line. And if you go 11-7, it's likely got to be one of those guys who might come out. And I think that'd be really hard to do. So... I could see it going either way. I think Hiller's preference is as a coach is probably the 11 seven look because we know how much he likes to kind of tinker with the lines and look for getting things going. Um, but right now I think it's going to be 12, six, at least for the next game, as long as that fourth line continues to be as, as steady as they are. And assuming everyone is healthy, fingers crossed. Uh, do you see yeah. the Arvidsson to know more, Second line staying together and Fiala and PLD on that third line? I think for now, yes. Um, but the good thing about the Kings is that Hiller has moved the pieces around so much that different guys have played with different guys. Like we know how well Kevin Fiala has fit alongside Dino and more. The Kings can go back to that, right? Just because they line up one way at the start of the game doesn't mean they can't tinker, doesn't mean they can't go back to things if things aren't going well or they want new looks. So I, I could definitely see the lines sticking together as they did last night against the ducks, but also, you know, Kevin Fiala has been versatile. He can go up and down the lineup. Arvidsson has meshed well alongside Dubois at times as well. Wouldn't be surprised at all. If, if those combinations did get switched around at times, um, because under Jim Hiller, we've come to learn, right? Like he's more than willing to move the pieces around maybe even more than we might think that he would. We're going to check out the Pacific Division standings, talk about the Western Conference playoff picture, and look ahead to possible playoff matchups for the Kings. We'll do that with the LA Kings insider Zach Dooley here on Locked on LA Kings, your team every day. 
And you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. I don't because I use Game Time, the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. I use Game Time to buy tickets to NHL and NFL games. I've done it this year. Uh, the app is super easy to navigate and use. They've got killer last minute deals and all in pricing. And the best price guaranteed. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you a complete peace of mind with your purchase. Love how you can view the seat before you buy it so you know exactly what you're going to get when you arrive. And Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They've got all in pricing. It shows you the total up front. You know exactly what you're going to get. No hidden fees. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps on the app. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Locked on NHL, L O C K E D O N N H L for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. The LA Kings face the Calgary Flames 7 30 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday. Catch every moment of the hometown broadcast of your LA Kings with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search. LA Kings. We close it out with LA Kings insider Zach Dooley and uh, Zach checking in on the standings in the Pacific Division. Vancouver and Edmonton have wrapped up playoff spots. Vancouver's got 104 points, five points up on the Oilers. Edmonton with 99 points, got a big game tonight. Edmonton versus Vegas. Connor McDavid, I don't know if he's going to play or not. He's nursing some kind of an injury, which is a wild card in all this. Kings have 93 points. They're one point ahead of Vegas, three points behind Nashville for that number one wild card spot in st louis we talked about it if they they lose tonight they're out and the kings uh are in uh kings got four games left so does vancouver edmonton six games left that's a busy stretch for them the rest of the way uh vegas five nashville just three and st louis four games now if the playoffs started today it would be the kings against the edmonton oilers in the first round I have gone on record, and again, I know I'm coming at this as a fan. I, I would love to see the Oilers catch Vancouver, and the Kings, of course, hold on to third. We get that 2-3 matchup with, against the Canucks team that the Kings have been very successful against this regular season. Um, and if we see Edmonton, uh, L.A. round three, I've got mixed feelings on that because while it, a, a win over them in the first round would feel even bigger, I think, than a first-round win, but a loss to them would also feel bigger than just a first-round loss because three years in a row – your thoughts on on the Kings' potential playoff matchups going forward? So there's two important battles, right? There's Kings, Golden Knights, Predators, and then there's Oilers, Canucks. Um, there's three viable first round opponents right now: Edmonton, Vancouver, and Dallas. Um, we saw how the Dallas series went this year. Kings went 0 three. Personally, I, I think that's that's probably the least favorable of the three. Agreed. Uh, you know, Dallas is a very deep team. They're kind of built similarly to LA and it's not, they don't have those, you know, 120 point players at the top, but they have so many guys down the lineup who can play. And that, that's a really tricky matchup for sure. Um, then it comes down to Vancouver and Edmonton. And one thing that I've learned over the last week or so, as I'm trying to forecast this stuff out is anytime you say, oh, it looks clear. They're, they're going to play the Oilers or, oh, they're going to play the Canucks or the Stars. Three days later, it changes. And it's like, oh, do you want to be the, the wild card team that faces the division winner because maybe you want Vancouver? Well, the Oilers could catch the Canucks. Like, it, it's very reasonable, right? You talk about all the games they have in hand. They could catch the Canucks, and it wouldn't be surprising. So you could do all this work to set up the matchup you want and then get the matchup you don't want. So it's very difficult to forecast that kind of – excuse me, at this time of the year. Kings have had the most success by far against the Canucks this season. So on paper, that's the matchup you'd say, oh, you want it. Um, but playoff hockey is obviously going to be very different. Um, I think that the Kings do have that track record against Vancouver this year of having success. Um, but if you guys talked about it after the Kings won this past weekend over Vancouver, and it's like the playoffs are different. The regular season games don't really matter. So I think the Kings have to focus on winning their games, getting in, going in with some momentum on their own game. And then you play who you play, because at the end of the day, you probably have to beat all of those teams anyway to get to where you want to get to. So go in feeling good, feeling confident in your own game, and then you get who you get. Hopefully you beat who you beat. I've said for me, I think kind of the wild card for the Kings in the in the postseason is getting something out of that power play. I mean, when it when they I mean, it seems kind of obvious, I guess, but. It, 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 I mean, when you look at the rankings, I think 11th in the league doesn't seem that bad, but I don't, obviously we were c convinced that last year it was so good 
that that was just going to carry over this year. But is there any kind of a wild card? I don't care if it's a player or a certain aspect of the Kings game that going into the playoffs, you're thinking that's something the Kings need to be consistent on or be better on. Power play is a good call. Um, power play is so interesting because if you go one of four, you're 25% and you're like a top, what you're in the top 10 at 25% for sure. But you look at one of four and you're like, that's three opportunities missed. Like that doesn't even feel that good. So power play percentages can sometimes feel deceiving. So the Kings are 11th, uh, but I think that's bolstered by a lot of, you know, two goal outings and, and big nights. And it hasn't been consistent all year. So the, the X factor for me is going to be Victor Arvidsson. He hasn't played very much this year, but he is an important piece on the power play. The Kings love that right-handed shot below the goal line operating from beside the net. So if Arvidsson is at his best, not only is he impacting games on the power play, but he rounds out the lineup at even strength as well. Because if he plays with more and to know, it gives Dubois a top six caliber winger, likely Kevin Fiala or maybe Quentin Byfield. And if you keep Fiala on that line, it puts Arvidsson with Dubois. So it gives him another top six caliber winger. So I, I think Arvidsson being at his best, as I thought he was in last year's playoffs, is a pretty big X factor. If he's at that level, it kind of rounds out the Kings lineup the way that they'd like it to round out. And as, real quick, Zach, uh, crazy news coming out of Arizona, I'm sure as you're aware of in the NHL. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, apparently the, the NHL has a contingency plan where they would move the Coyotes to Salt Lake City. And then if Arizona can get their stuff together and get an arena built, they would then give them an expansion franchise to get hockey back in the desert where obviously the NHL wants it because of all they, you know, they've stuck with that team for a long time. The Kings have played preseason games in Salt Lake. They're scheduled to do again next year. Have as LA kind of helped lay the groundwork for Salt Lake City as being an NHL city? They probably have. And think about Vegas, right? The Kings played in Vegas for how many years? That's true. Yeah. That, you know that team um, came about. So it's it's a good reflection on the Kings, right? To be playing these games in prospective markets. Um, obviously, a very ambitious owner in Utah wanting to bring a team there. Um, so hopefully it's a win-win. The King kind of helped to develop that market. They, they get some fans there and, you know, you never know how these things kind of play out. Um, but clearly, you know, there's support for the game in Salt Lake City. The Kings have sold out the lower bowl, I think, every time that they've played there. And this past year, we're pretty solid in the upper bowl as well. So definitely a lot of support in, in Salt Lake City. And if they get a team and it ends, you know, this edition of playing a neutral site preseason game, then it's a win. For everybody right because it helped to kind of grow the game with another team on this side of the country that is la kings insider zach dooley you can follow him on x twitter at dooley lak and obviously check out his work at lakingsinsider.com zach always a pleasure great insights looking forward to talking to you in the playoffs we'll see you out at crypto.com arena for playoff hockey as well really appreciate it thanks for your time and uh all the best with uh, being the kings insider of course thanks for having me all right, that is Zach Dooley. Hope you guys enjoyed that. For you everydayers, those of you that listen and watch Locked on LA Kings every day, Thursday we're going to preview that Kings-Flames matchup, which likely will be another opportunity for the Kings to punch their playoff ticket. Friday, of course, we'll recap that game, hopefully get to talk about the Kings as a playoff team. And, of course, it's a Friday, so a Kings fan feedback show as well. Uh, if you want to get in on that by saying, sending an email, the email address is lockedoneddy at gmail.com, E-D-D-I-E. You can always leave your comments if you're watching on YouTube in the comment section below. Appreciate that. It helps the algorithm for people to find the show. So likes and comments are awesome. Uh, we would love for you to stay interactive with the show by following us on X, Twitter, Instagram. We're at Locked On LA Kings. I'm Eddie Garcia. Thank you, as always, for listening and watching this episode of Locked On LA Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Have a great rest of your day. We will talk to you on Friday. Actually, we'll talk to you on Thursday and then Friday. And as always, go Kings go.